Uh, anyway, uh, I'm Kristen Blizzard, and we are here here with my husband Trent, and also Hua Fam tonight. Hello. Um, hi, Trent. Yeah, hi. I was just getting ready to start the Facebook Live. I'm like, two <laughs> things going at once. You'll have to forgive ah. me. Um, I think we should just make small talk for a minute and then start because there'll be people waiting there to watch, okay. and that would be nice. So. Well, hey, everybody, jump on chat. Let us know where you're from tonight. Looks like we have about yeah, 50, let's see who's 50, here. 50 people here already. Just... Okay, so um, let's, uh, let's kind of start and uh, talk a little bit about you, Hua, uh, and we'll tell everybody more about you. Um, you've been foraging here in, the, in Colorado on the Front Range since, I think, 2013. Ish. And, <laughs> ish, okay. Uh, and down in the down in the Pikes Peak area where you've been very involved. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about, about that and the society yeah. down there. Yeah, um, Pikes Peak Mycological Society is down in Colorado Springs. I, uh, my husband and I used to live up in Woodland Park. So when I got interested on in mushrooms, uh, the end of 20, the end of summer of 2013, um, we joined the club in 2014. And Brian, of course, Brian Barzi is wonderful. He's very knowledgeable. Um, and I learned a lot from them. Uh, and I did have rookie mistakes, like in 2013, when I first looked at it on my own, I collected a bunch of agaricus and suillus and cooked them up and really did not have a nice digestive experience for about a week. <laughs> so I don't, I don't bother picking those guys anymore. Um, but, but I've uh, seen you so, give advice on Facebook about those particular mushrooms, about agaricus to, to go slow, make sure you know what you're eating, cook them well sample yes. them <laughs> again yes, this is hard don't make my mistake because it's not fun <laughs> and i'm not sure which made me sick if it was the soilus or the agaricus but you know if you're gonna try something new i always recommend do a little of just that one and see how you react before you go nuts and um yeah and, and it could very well be i might have picked um the, the yellow staining, Xanthodermis uh, agaricus, and cooked that up and mixed with everything else, and that might have been what caused my sickness, but I just figure soils are slimy, and agaricus, I can just uh -huh. buy it at the store, and I'll be safe, so. <laughs> yeah. And you know, agaricus are a difficult mushroom. I've been yeah. um, watching, especially Facebook, uh, the Colorado Mycological Society and a few others, and have done a lot of searching in there for the word agaricus and for spe uh, specific species. And I've gathered up my little, my little bit of information about each species, just so when I find them, I can ID them, because they, they are pretty tricky. Um, so I've been studying them, and, and Kristen's very excited that we're going to start eating agaricus. Uh, that we really? Home. You're good. But the, I, only, I, the only one I've safely, after my experience, have tried is the Augustus. Yeah. The Prince, because it obviously is very distinctive. <laughs> and I, I do don't think have to, yeah. They're definitely an intermediate mushroom, though, I would say. Not yeah. something that... a a super beginner would just jump right into Hua. Right, because <laughs> there are a few that will make you sick, trust me. <laughs> so um, so um, tonight, Hua is going to sort of tell us about, and we're going to explore the science behind mushrooms. Um, she is super uh, amazing at kind of getting into terrain and aspect and trees and weather and really studying the science behind each and every mushroom she is going after. And she has been very successful in her last few years as a mushroom hunter. Um, Brian Barzi will tell you she is quite the morel chaser and does really well. So uh, we are gonna start tonight with spore prints, which I think is super cool because it's something that is incredibly useful in mushroom identification and not a lot of people do it. Um, so Hua's gonna sh start with that and show us how to do that. And we're gonna be talking about um, pheasant backs, half-free morels, wood ears, black morels, chanterelles, hedgehogs, white velites, and lobster mushrooms if we get to all that. So awesome, thank you for being here. We so appreciate yeah, thank you. Thank you. 
Yeah. Absolutely. So to make a spore print, first, when you're finding a mushroom and you don't know what it is, um, the easiest thing to do is identify, you know, does it have gills? Does it have pores? False gills, whatever. But it, from there, you should make a spore print and uh, to help identify, especially for certain toxic lookalikes when you're looking for things like um, the wild enoki, flamulina. Uh, those have white spore prints. And then, of course, on wood, also growing on wood would be the gallerina, which has like a rusty brownish spore print. So spore prints are important when you're just beginning. So the only mushroom, fresh mushroom that I have was oysters that I found in the woods like this past week. Um, and uh, two, th two ways I do spore prints is I'll either use an aluminum foil or a piece of aluminum foil or clear plastic. And you just cut off the stem, the base right here so that it can lay flat on top of your printing surface like so. And I prefer aluminum foil or clear plastic or glass, whatever you have, um, because then you can, white spore prints will show up. A lot of people will do a spore print on white paper and nothing happens. So I did one on aluminum foil. You, I don't think you can see it because it's pretty reflective. Yeah. But if you hide, hold it up to the light, you'll see the print. And you can kind of tell the color. Um, when it comes to light colors, I think uh, clear plastic works better because once I take this print and I place it on top of white paper, you can kind of see that this particular oyster has a grayish lilac color to it, mm -hmm. which would tell me that it is a Pleurotus pulmonarius. Pulmonaris. I always forget how to pronounce that. Um, as opposed to, because this guy was found on cottonwood and that means it could either be the pulmonaris or the populophila, populinus. I always forget. Can you, can, you hold, can you hold that oyster mushroom up to the camera and so people can see the bottom side and the gills and then talk about, about how long, did you leave that overnight? How long did that take um, you? Just a couple few hours because it was a pretty fresh, although it's been sitting and drying out. But the, the gills are decurrent, which means it runs down the stem. Of course, I cut off a big chunk of the stem just so that it would lay flat. And this is actually just a section of it. I cut it in half so that I could do it on both, on both um, aluminum foil and, and the clear plastic plate that I had. Um, but they'll grow in clusters. I just ripped this one off of the cluster that I harvested. Um, and it's starting to dry out now because it's been sitting out on the counter for like all day. Um, but they usually are creamy white when fresh. And I prefer to pick them when fresh because they're not buggy. And that happens a lot when you find big giant ones. Um, yeah, so this was found in the riparian areas uh, among cottonwoods on a dead cottonwood stump or tree, uh, which is the same area as the blonde morels that I'm actually looking for, <laughs> but I haven't found because my area hasn't warmed up enough. Maybe in a few days. I'll check yes. again. Okay. So, but uh, yeah, so that's basically it. If, if your mushroom is old or dry, uh, put a little drop of water on the cap, place it on your, your spore printing surface and then put a bowl or something on top to, uh, to keep it moist. And you should be able to get a spore print within, you know, a couple of hours. If you leave it longer, you'll just, especially with oysters, I've left an oyster sitting on my uh, wooden counter and after a few hours, my whole counter's dusted in white stuff. Um, which is kind of hard to get out, <laughs> yeah. especially on wooden surfaces, on, on stainless steel, no problem. But uh, yeah, so that's pretty much how I do my spore prints. Um, other people have other recommendations. It's also good to have, I mean, when you do spore prints of some mushrooms, it comes out really pretty, like agaricus makes really pretty spore prints. Yeah. Talk um, about that for a minute, Kristen, because she has, she has a little hobby. She likes to do something with spore prints. Uh, I yeah I'm on I'm on a mission this year to collect uh, 
sort of some larger mushrooms with more space between the gills, like an agaricus, um, because I would like to make a giant art installation out of a spore print and put it on the wall in the house. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> but yeah. That would be cool. Kind of geeky, kind of geeky, but you know. <laughs> they really photograph well when you when you get a spore print on a piece of white paper and take a picture. It really is uh, can be can be striking. Yeah. Yeah. Do, have you figured out how to keep it from smudging once you so that you can maybe, you know? Uh, well, yeah. you know what I would do, and this is kind of an aside, random, but <laughs> I would take a picture of it right away and then. Um, vectorize the file so that mm. I can make it I could put it on the side of a house if I wanted to you know what I mean yeah. um, I think if you were trying to preserve the actual spore print I don't know there must be some sort of spray or something I would imagine that you could dust it's over it to kind of like the floral spray yeah or... some something yeah I'm not sure anyway yeah. you know yeah. fun art projects for us mushroom geeks <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so, it, what else should we add? Anything to spore printing before we kind of well, move on? In general, with say just IDing a mushroom, you should mm. really take if you're going to post a photo on Facebook or any IDing forum and asking people to help identify, make sure you take clear pictures of the whole mushrooms, top, bottom whether it has gills, pores, or whatever, as its spore-bearing surface, the stem, if it has any, and it helps to dig up the whole thing. It won't hurt the mycelium. Uh, dig it up and take a picture of the base to note any you know, distinctive characteristic. That's how, if you wanna get your mushroom identified positively on Facebook or any of those other groups, uh, yeah, you yeah, gotta make sure you get like clear pictures of the whole thing. Um, don't take a picture of just the top that's kind of grainy and submit that and say, what is this and can I read it because. <laughs> hey, hey, you guys, can we just take a pause for a second? I am getting some um, notes here that say some people are getting a, a really large amount of feedback and having a hard time hearing. Um, let's see. Uh, Peter is saying that it's almost like he's hearing two versions of a webinar. Is it possible, Trent, you have another version open or something somewhere? Is anyone else having any pr problems like that? Peter, I wonder if you have two versions open on your computer. Everyone else here is saying no audio problems. Is it, is it me that sounds bad? Do I have the feedback? Turn off their mics. Um, I think we're doing okay. I think everybody else hears us okay. Okay. Huh. Someone said my mic is hot. I don't know what that means. That's what is that? because you were talking. Oh, okay. I think. I think so too. Okay. Well, hopefully, Peter, I'm sorry. I'm not sure. It seems like Seems like everyone else is having an okay experience. Okay. Over on Facebook, I'm watching the feed there. They, they say they can hear it as well. So there's okay. several people on Facebook. Um, we were talking about taking pictures of morels or mushrooms to get ID <laughs> on Facebook. And if you did that and took all those wonderful pictures, you, you, would, you would be you know, top 10% of your class and, and people that submit pictures to Facebook. And if you did a spore print first and reported on the spore color, you would be a rock star. People would be jumping all over your post to tell you what you would is. also You would also be a, a rock star if you, also, you can note the trees and the environment it was growing on. I mean, a lot of picture people will pick a mushroom, cut off the stem, bring it home, then take a picture and ask. And the follow-up questions are always, where was this? You know, what kind of plants were, trees were growing around it? Was it growing on the ground and the, you know, on wood? What's the substrate? So you might as well just take an in-situ photo right there and make sure that it's nice and clear, get the picture of it in the ground with, you know, the surrounding trees or make a note of them. And, and usually the trees that we're looking for is like deciduous type trees hardwoods, um, 
Yeah, or and any, any tree. Yeah. yeah, is it on the ground or on a tree? Trees or shrubs. Or, I mean, there are some mushrooms that will grow just about anywhere. So, <laughs> but those don't count. But there are a lot of mycorrhizal mushrooms that you need to know what kind of trees are growing to be able to identify it properly. How are you at identifying all the kind of random mushrooms that show up here in Colorado? I mean, we, we really mm -hmm. focus on edible ones. So when people show pictures of things, we're like, can't eat it. <laughs> I'm fair to Medlin. When it comes to Amanitas, obviously, the, the easy ones are the Muscarias, right? The Mario mushrooms. Um, uh, and some other Amanitas. Uh, but I, it, it's very easy to recognize an Amanita for me. Yeah. Uh, and when it comes to oysters, again, it comes down to the spore print. If you really want to know the exact species, you'd have to do a spore print and sometimes microscopy, which I do not have a microscope. So I don't get that nerded out. I have yeah. other. That's, ne that's <laughs> next level stuff there. Yeah, guess. I have other interests that keep me distracted um, enough that I, I don't feel like getting a microscope. I don't have a room. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so uh, some of the funky shrooms, that I'm, I'm fair to meddling. I, when I first started, I tried to like learn at least one or two species or a genus or uh, um, a year so that I can 100% identify. But l the last few years have been kind of slacking off because we've been moving and, you know, so I've been just hunting the edibles in the last few years. So I've kind of forgotten some of the scientific names. I have to like type it in and it'll Google take me there. <laughs> well, well as a, go ahead. I was just going to say, speaking of edibles, why don't we jump in yeah. and talk about the pheasant back? Pheasant well, shrimp. wait. First, though, uh, we do have uh, another edible to show here in, in, in context of spore printing. Oh. Here we oh, go. Oh, yes. Um, and and uh, Hua, do you want to talk about how many spores come out and what that means? And I'll play this video. Millions and millions of spores. So this video, I was... I was actually just cleaning some black morels that I found um, and and the sun was just setting so that it looked it I could see all this spore just blowing off of the tray and uh, I took a quick video and in that little was it left hand corner <laughs> you can kind of see all those spores blowing out and that was just setting there on the counter um so they they will spore a ton and i think at the end of the day when i was done cleaning everything my whole entire coffee table was covered in spores so um you know so, so when people get a little snippy about how you harvest <laughs> i'm like don't worry the spores will be yeah. dispersed um yeah. but they the don't only they don't need our help do they not really, no. And, and, and there are certain mushrooms that I would not want sporulating in my house. Mm -mm. Um, but anyways. Well, morels are one. I, we, we've dried, you know, you, you, you pick a bunch of morels and put them in your dehydrator and you run that in your house, yeah. you're, you're going to have regrets. Yes, absolutely. I've had that. <laughs> my dehydrator filter is like completely caked over with spores that you have to mm -hmm. scrape off before you do the next batch. So now I have like one of those... Uh, hanging dehydrator racks that you just hang outside and that does the job so um at least for the morels uh is the burn ones from last year but uh yeah so when you're doing a spore print of an asco because it doesn't have a gill surface you can just lay it on your tray and uncover it and it'll cover the the whole paper or whatever surface so all right I guess we'll start talking about the pheasant back, which scientific name now is Seriochorus squamosus. It used to be Poliparus squamosus. Um, other common names, pheasant back, dryad saddle, and sometimes I've seen people call it hawk wings, but hawk wings are completely different mushroom in Colorado. Uh, so I try not to use common names too much when it comes to certain specific edibles um but yeah i i'll find these guys on cottonwood stumps while i'm hunting morels i find i've noticed that they tend to grow on the cottonwoods that oysters are done eating 
I mean, all the most of the bark is gone and it's coming out of like a fissure in the in the log. Um, but they they typically for me, I found them fruiting in the spring around the same time as uh, the blonde morels, and um, they smell like if you don't if you've never found one and you're not sure if you can identify, they really do smell like watermelon rinds or cucumbers, that kind of greenish, the, the white part of the watermelon, not the actual watermelon. Um, I've never tried eating them because I'll pick it like this one in the photo. I've picked it meaning that, you know, to try it and I just never got around to it because I found a ton of morels and well, when you have the option, morels take take the cake. So. Um, but uh, yeah, they're edible when young. Uh, the tender pieces you can just slice up and saute. Uh, otherwise, if it's woody, hard, they'll grow back every year. So just come back the next year if you want to find a fresh one or you can pick it and use it for stock. I've been told. I don't know how that turns out. Um, but yeah, so, so along that line, um, let's see. So it grows on hardwood logs in Aspen, on Aspen and Cottonwood in Colorado. And typically springtime, but you might find them in the fall. They're more of a cool weather mushroom, just like oysters and enoki. They, they grow when the, it's cooler outside with lower temperatures and, and higher levels of humidity. Um, so, so those yeah. are they. And they're pretty, um, if, I think if you get them when they're, when they're older, they're, they're pretty, they're pretty tough. Um, they are you're gonna eat them. <laughs> Yeah, you want to get these, you want to get these young ones and maybe slice them really thin, maybe with a mandolin to kind of make them a little less tender uh, and uh, saute them with a lot of liquid in the pan so they don't dry up. Those are, those are my eating notes on that one. Right. I have, again, I've picked them and then just never got around to trying them. I, I just like finding mushrooms more than I necessarily like cleaning and cooking. <laughs> yeah. And this is a pretty small one. It hasn't really opened up yet. Right. Um, apparently it, too, like a, I was gonna say you could eat the pores or not. It's up to you whether you like the texture on them, uh, but not, not the stem, well, the, I don't think. The pore surface is pretty shallow on these yeah. guys. So I wouldn't, I, if, if they're this young in the, like this photo, I wouldn't bother scraping off the pores. Yeah. We have a question. Is the pheasant back a polypore? It is. That's the, the original name was polyporous squamosis. Um, but I think according to Quo, there were two type specimens for polyporous and uh, the one that the, the pheasant back is closely related to um, lost. So it, it got to be classified. <laughs> okay, you'll have to say according to Quo. Talk about that for a minute. What, what does that mean, according to Quo? So, uh, well, Quo, Michael Quo is mu the mushroom expert. He's got a few books. Well, he's got quite a few books out. Uh, I think he wrote The 100 Edible Mushrooms. He wrote a book um, about morels. He co-authored with Kathy Cripps and Vera on the Rocky Mountain Mushrooms the by Habitat. Habitat. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure he has other books, a yeah. hundred cool mushrooms or something like that. And, and he's a good friend. Um, I met him at the 2014 Mushroom Fair in, at CMS up in Denver. And um, we became friends after that. So I kind of text him now and again and pick his brain. But I do use his website a lot, themushroomexpert.com to help me identify. He does not go over edibility but he does talk about the habitat, the, the, the macro, uh, macroscopic and microscopic description so that you can compare it to what you have and identify it. And then if you want edibil edibility, you can always Google it. Um, I'm just gonna hold up this, I'm gonna talk so you guys can see this book. Here's the 100 edible mushrooms. This is a great, one of our favorite books. It's a good one. And then this one is the uh, Rocky Mountain Mushrooms by Habitat that we're talking about here. So, yes. So I looked up the pheasant back, the Seraporus omosus, and he, on Mushroom Expert, and he has a little description of the naming and why it may or may not change. But I believe it's changed to Seraporus. I've seen that that genus uh, for the last couple of years. 
And so. the mushroom expert is is really maybe the best online uh, yes. website um, as opposed to the other types of websites. It's the best online website for, for like Mushroom ID. He has so much information um, and mm -hmm. it's up to date. Uh, it's a really nice website for researching your species. That is right. mushroomexpert.com, right? <clears throat> yes. Okay. I'll pop Good. And Good to know. He is usually the first that I go to, however. He has told me that from henceforth, he only wants to have on his website mushrooms he's actually studied. So he's hmm. not going to have all of them. He used to have, a, have keys for each um, family. Yeah, genus yeah. even. Genus. Yeah. yeah, so he has keys that bring mm -hmm. breaks it down to gene, all the way down to genus and species, though now he only has links to species he's, he has a record of that he's actually physically studied and is going into his herbarium. Um, so a lot of times I can get to genus and then I have to like do a Google image search or something of what I think it might be and narrow it down from there. So he took his he, keys off the site? No, his keys are still there, but they're not 100% complete. Like, you know, there's certain um, species or genre that he doesn't have in his location because he's in Illinois, so he's not going to have access to all these other places unless people mail it, send it to him. And I've sent him a few, quite a few. Every time I go there, it seems like he's got the information on the species. Yeah, it's so another... I love the site. Is it S. Vims? And I forget. It's a mycological society, Southern Vancouver International Mycological Society, or something like that. Uh, S. Vims. They have really good keys for like the Pacific Northwest and Rocky Mountain type mushrooms, but they're very in depth, and sometimes you can get lost in the weeds. Um, a little too geeky. If anybody knows that website, feel free to pop it in the chat for everybody. The S, is it S-V-I-M-S dot C-A maybe? I think. Uh, club. Uh, let me see if I can. I don't know. We can let people find it. We don't have to go search yeah. for it now if we don't have it. That's okay. Yeah. Why, uh, don't, we, we, why don't we, why don't we move? We have a, yeah. a, I, from S-Vims, they have a, a kind of a, an IDing ability that they have a ton of photos and you can download it. And I did this a few years back, but that was on an old phone. So okay. <laughs> I now just. Photos. Anyway, but those are some good resources for identification. Um, I just popped it in the chat for everybody. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. All so right, why don't we jump on to the half free morels? Oh, the half free morels. So the half free morels, I've only found um, growing with blonde morels, which, you know, I guess it's a little odd because they're considered a black, but in other regions where there isn't such huge elevation changes and the black morels and the blonde morels kind of grow in the same areas, blacks will pop up first. And um, so the half free morels classified as a black morel. And the one that I found was punked a piece. I donated it to Vera, well, the Denver, Botanic Garden. Um, so they have a record of it. It's a, uh, it's the Marcella puncta piece and it was growing in the leaf litter along, well, you can tell those leaves are cottonwood leaves and it was kind of in a very shady area. So I think that's why I found these the same time as uh, the blondes because that area was still cooler temperature as opposed to the warmer spots, they were all gone. Um, but yeah, so you might happen upon a black morel or a half green morel while hunting the spring. So explain explain to folks why it's called half free. So I wish I had a photo of it sliced in half, but it literally, if you slice it in half, it, it is a uh, hollow on the inside, but the cap is attached halfway down the stem. So half of the halfway down the cap. Most morels are attached at the bottom. So these kind of halfway up. There, there you, go. you go. So that's a half free. It, the, the stem should be completely hollow. Um, and that's why they're half free. There's also a semi, semi libre and popula, populinus, populifila. Um, but the, popu, uh, the, the cottonwood half free only grows around 
black cottonwoods, which we do not have in Colorado, as far as anyone knows. <laughs> so that's and why. And do you eat do you eat these guys? Do they taste the same as a morel? I have not because the ones that I found, I donated to the herbarium. Oh, okay. Because I had like such huge clusters of blondes that I was like, here, you can have these. Yeah. They're, they're pretty small. I mean, I think they were, that particular one might have been two two inches tall at the most. So the cap is, you know, maybe a half inch, like a thimble. So you kind of have to find quite a few of them to make it a worthy meal, in my opinion. Okay. And I had found like a, a small handful. So I gave them all to, to Vera. But yes, they are definitely morels, so they are edible. And mm. they look sort of like the Verpa bohemica that was discussed last week. Um, they do, which is the uh, a false morel. And the difference yeah, it's being considered... that in the Verpa, the, the stem has kind of like a pithy, it's yeah, not hollow. And, and it's attached right at the top of this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, some it's people fully free. I've never tried them. There you go. Um, someone wants to know if you have found blondes in Denver yet this year. I've seen people finding blondes in Denver. Yeah. Yeah, I was just up in like the Littleton area, you know, checking out warmer areas than my usual spots and the conditions were perfect, but I, I didn't find one and I don't know why, <laughs> but it is still early. I think by it early. is, it is, but people have been finding them. So they start, been, start keeping your eyes open in Denver. Yeah photos that I've seen they're so yeah pretty. Orion says he picked a couple this weekend I saw that on Facebook Orion yeah I saw that too <laughs> lucky. lucky but yeah my my spots are slightly cooler temp I think by mid by midweek and end of this week I'll definitely find a few cool give it a few more days um so I am excited to move on to the next mushroom because I Trent and I have not found a ton of these. We've found a few here and there, but not in Colorado. And I just think they're fascinating. And I think they're pretty awesome for use in Asian cooking, especially. So talk to us about the wood ear mushroom and where you find these in Colorado. So the wood ear mushroom, Auricularia americana. I think is the current name for the American wood ears, but there's some that grow on hardwood, others that grow on conifers. This particular ones um, that I find grow on Douglas fir logs. And, um, and I find them in the springtime. Usually I'll find them when I'm scouting my black morel spots to check the conditions, I'll find these guys. So they kind of pop up a couple of weeks before the black, the natural black start popping up in in Douglas fir forests, um, and yeah, they'll they'll they're they can be quite prolific. I think one year I found so many I didn't know what to do with. I made I made sweet and sour soup. I cut them up and put them in like this Vietnamese crepe dish. All sorts of stuff, and I still had leftovers, so I dried them and I still have a container of them dry. <laughs> Also, so, so, peop so people know when you go order like a hot and sour soup at a Chinese restaurant, those little bits, those little brown bits in the soup, those are wood ear mushrooms. Yes. So you so, maybe have been eating them and you didn't even know. Exactly. They're, they're very popular in Chinese cuisine or Asian cuisines in general. But um, I think the Chinese or my friend who's Laotian calls them rat ears. In Vietnamese, they're called cat ears. And I've also heard mouse ears, <laughs> kind of that texture. Uh, <laughs> but uh, when they're dried, they're like black, like a really dark, dark brown to black color. But fresh, they're kind of more of a, you know, tannish, light, a lighter shade of brown. Um, but yeah, I, I like finding them, but I'm, you know, usually not looking for them specifically, but they're they're hanging around the places I hunt. So yeah, these uh, are heart, are Douglas fir. And I found them around elevations of around 60, 700 and up because I don't hunt much lower than that other, unless they're blondes. Um, in the spring on conifers, like I said, Douglas firs, and there is a deciduous group. I haven't found those. I don't think though I did Happened to find some jelly looking things on 
scrub oak that I just wrote off as like a meteor looking exidia recessa, recessa. <laughs> um, and that was on scrub oak near at lower elevations on um, off the same trail that I found these guys in. Um, but I really think those were exidia. So, I can't so get... how do you harvest these guys off the tree when you find them? I just slice them right along the right along the wood, the bark. I, I, I don't, them. yeah, I don't rip out any of the material. The because, tree. Yeah, the, yeah, it just, if you go back to like a bigger, the, the more close up photo, you can kind of tell, you just kind of slice it, put your mushroom knife it's kind like of right, right along the bark. Yeah, there's a cut. <laughs> and, and are these guys gonna be coming back in the same tree every year for a while? Yes, they will. I. I haven't seen them fruiting on bare, like barkless Douglas though. So I'm, I'm guessing once all the bark is gone, they'll probably be done. But yes, I see them every year. Um, usually I'll, I'll find remnants of them now because uh, this spot is really far from me now. So uh, <laughs> I well, don't we, have about, a, we have a couple questions it, coming in real quick. Uh -huh. um, Ella commented that uh, the uh, woodier near her must disappear whenever it's dry like it is now. Yes. Um, and Robert asked a good question. Can it be confused with any other mushrooms? Do you have any ID uh, tips? They or? can be confused with Exidia recessa, R-E-C-I-S-A. Um, but those seem to... I usually only find those on like scrub oak kind of hardwoods uh, and they're more jelly. These have a firmer texture. Um, I don't know if there are any poisonous or toxic lookalikes, but these, the woodier has a thicker, firmer texture than the, the exidia, which is squishy in my opinion. <laughs> um, and typically a darker brown. And that's one of the great things about the book we held up earlier, the 100 edible mushrooms are, he, he does go into uh, details on lookalikes that you might need to pay attention to. Kristen, talk for a minute while you hold it up. Yeah, here's the book again. I don't know if you guys can see if I'm talking. Uh, actually, Trent, they might not be able to because we're on the photos. You might have to switch oh, view. Oh, let me switch oh, view. Oh, I Hang see on. you in the tunnel. Yeah, yeah okay. now you should be able to see me, I think, when I'm talking. But here it is, 100 edible mushrooms. Um, awesome. Brooke is asking about the flavor profile of the wood ear. Um, oh. How would you describe it? Like earthy? Crunchy. <laughs> Crunchy? <laughs> chewy? It is, it is earthy. I, I wouldn't say chewy necessarily. A little bit chewy, especially the dried and rehydrated ones. Um, mm. But yeah, I would say kind of earthy, not a lot of flavor. That's why they're in like hot and sour soup. It's more for a texture thing, I think. Um, yeah. Like Elsa, Ella just said, more for texture, pretty tasteless. But it, it, it has a very mild scent and flavor to it. So yeah, it, it has that crunchy, chewy snap. I, yeah. I okay. sure would like a big jar of dried ones in my kitchen to add to some of my foods, which <laughs> we don't have. But I think we may have to get out in the next couple of weeks and look for those. Yeah, yeah I... I like I said, I think those guys I find a couple of weeks before I find the first black morel in that area. So springtime and when it's wet. So wait for a good springtime rain or snow to go through. And then once, you know, oh, that's a nice, nice off, picture. Yeah. Here's yeah, another you'll... really nice picture. But yeah, that it? year, that's all I could find was, were wood ears. And I found very few blacks that year in that spot. That, but you know, some years you win, some years you lose. Yeah. Well, Last year was huge for morels for, for us. Let's segue into, into blacks from there. Cause you know, you're, you're finding these in the same area. You were scouting the blacks. So clearly you're in some Doug fir forests. So there's two types of blacks other than, well, make that three if you count the half free. Um, but two types of natural black morels up in the, that we know of up in Colorado mountains, uh, the Brunea and the Snyder Eye. So where I find those wood ears on Doug fir and predominantly Douglas fir, there's occasional aspen here and there, but it's mostly Doug fir. Um, 
I believe that's uh, Marcella Snyderi, uh, just based on description. It doesn't quite fit 100%, but uh, those are the ones that I find the big honking one, black ones. I mean, honking. Let me, <laughs> let me show those. Let me yeah. show those here. Um, I don't think this is the one you mean. Uh, that is in the same area, but there's one that was like 11 ounces. That I, yeah, that guy is pretty big. That one weighed in around eight ounces. Uh, so it wasn't the biggest one we found in this area. But I think those might be the Snyder Eye just based on the description because the stem, when you cut it, it has a lot of folds and ridges on the stem. Um, and it's got a very thick, meaty texture. I mean, even the cap, when you slice it in half, the hollow portion is not very big. It's, it's mostly meat and a tiny little hollow space. Like, um, like folds almost, right? Yeah, so the, like the stem has a bunch of folds and, <clears throat> and crevices in there. Um, and that's why I think maybe it's <laughs> dry, but I've, I've messaged Michael Quo and asked him about this particular species. And he says he doesn't think Colorado morels have been very well documented. And so it's, he doesn't know. And I, I offered to give it to him to do a DNA sequencing because he did do a big morel study a few years back. And he said he, he politely declined saying he was done with morels. <laughs> And that I should just donate it to to Andy Wilson at the herbarium, and I'm like, well, he already has one. He has one. Yeah, of you should donate that to your belly. Eight ounces. <laughs> yeah. That is a, that yes. is a, that is a big a boy. It, it one of these guys will feed you know make a dish that can feed four. Just one. Wow. <laughs> so. no, I, I have heard from a, 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 a I guess it's Bertain Morin. We've been we were talking about morel species, and that maybe mm -hmm. the Brunei is a is a burn morel. And, the, and it looks exactly like the Snyder eye. Uh, um, no, there's another burn morel that? I was just looking at and I can't remember the name. But no, Brunea is a natural black. And I had a few, I don't know if you picked any of those in the photos, but those I find around 8,000 or higher elevation in a mix, mixed conifers. I, I found them amongst aspens as well as these. These here, no, or should I go back? This one, the Brunea. This one, I think, is Snyderi. But again, there were only two species that they list, not that one. You may not have picked it. They're not as pretty as those. They're smaller in stature. That's a burn. That's, that yeah, that's like the Snyderi that I, or suspected Snyderi's. And, uh, so I don't know if you have any of my, I, I shared some, but I don't know if you saved those off. Snyder Eye again. This is all Douglas fir stuff. Well, run us through, uh, run us through the habitat what the, and the, the seasonality and um, yeah. you know, science, if you, if you were, us, science us, these, these guys. So, all right. I use a lot of online resources to figure out when the heck I'm going because now I live in Castle Rock and I'm really far away from these guys. Probably a good, hour and a half to two hour drive thereabouts. So I use like uh, precipitation maps and I check the weathers, weather stations to see what the temperature, daily temperatures are. And I haven't tried moisture maps yet, or not moisture maps, um, soil temperature maps. But I kind of played around with it today. And I think if you're gonna use one of those, get the five day average on soil temps because it's only measuring like the surface temp, which at times can be pretty high. Um, yeah, I'm not so, impressed with those soil temp maps yeah, really, really being helpful. I haven't used them too much. I, I use the, the moisture map to see when it rained and how much rain it got in the last week or two. And then I check the, the daily temperatures in a town nearby and I can kind of gauge it at that point. Um, and so the Brunea, the natural blacks up in the mountains, like I said, they're, they're a little smaller than the Snyder eyes. Um, and they are completely hollow all the way through. Their, their stem doesn't have all those folds that I was talking about and um, not as meaty, but they are 
saprobic as well as mycorrhizal under hardwoods and conifers. Like I said, I, I usually find them in a mixed conifer forest with aspens and sometimes spruce or double fir or even pine. So it's in those areas. Um, let's see, do, do, do. Uh, usually the Bruneas I find late, late May or early June through the month of June into very early July. Um, elevations from 8,000 and up is where I normally find them along the front range. Well, and that's pretty high up there, 8,000 and up. Yeah, well, that's usually where I, well, I, like I said, I lived in Woodland Park, so that's around 8,400. <laughs> and all the trails that I hunt are oh. in that range and I don't, so there's like a big jump between where I hunt and, and the Snyder Eyes though is a different area. It's not in Woodland Park and that one, I think the trail starts around 6,700, but I don't find them or 6,500, but I don't find them until I get to about 67 to 7,000 feet. Um, and this, like I said, Snyder Eye in the spring, I usually find them before the Bruneas um, around mid to late May and then through early June and, um, or until it dries out because that area gets really So cold. they're lower, they're lower and earlier. Yeah, so typically I'll, I'll go hunt my blondes and then the blondes and the, the, the big fat blacks, they kind of overlap like near the mid and end of May so that I can hunt both if, I, if I'm that motivated in a day. Um, but yeah, they're higher elevation than of course the, the blondes or yellow morels and um, but they do fruit at least in this area sometime around May 20th, thereabouts. So mid to late May is usually when I start finding them, but um, they are finicky at least from my experience because if it's dry, this area, there's a creek and if you hike, you can, if, if I don't hear the creek trickling, I don't bother, I just go home because there have been previous years when I go look and it's dry as about nothing. So now that I live far away, I might do a, I might do some recon next month to check it out. And, uh, and if I don't see any water along the Creek, I'm not going to go back is all I can say because I don't live close enough anymore. Um, but yeah, so, so you can start looking for blacks around mid May. How high? You said that they start at eight. How high are you going up? Um, well, for the Brunea, uh, I from eight thousand up. I found them at about ten thousand in July, mid July. So you know, they can still happen. And and yeah, well, I think one year I was looking for bolides, like just looking for buttons because it gets so buggy. I was looking for buttons, and I actually found a handful of black of, of the. Brunea ones, and that was over 10,000 feet elevation. And it was like the end of July. So they can fruit all season if you keep following them up the hill. Uh, but yeah, they'll start around eight. And the Snyder eyes, I haven't found them above 8,000 because I'm not usually looking for them. But if I happen upon them, I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> okay, here's a big question for you. Um, if you could only pick blondes or blacks, um, and I, which which one is the most kind of abundant, do you think, and, and the one that you would focus on? I'd say when it comes to the naturals, the blonde's probably the easier to pick. But you have to fend off rattlesnakes and other snakes and poison ivy. And I'm very sensitive to poison ivy because I'm al I've already got a small rash starting on, on my back, which is really annoying um, and I, because I haven't found them all yet. And I'm like, I shouldn't get poison ivy until. So, so that's the downside of hunting blondes is I, I'm covered in poison ivy rashes by the, you know, by the end of that season. Um, and, you know, if, you, if you're wigged out by snakes, you might not like that. The natural blacks, you won't have to deal with snakes or poison ivy. And they're in very a very scenic location too. Yeah, they're very scenic, but you'll have to hike uphill for it, and you know, and uh, contend with the the the, uh, the low oxygen. And so, you know, <laughs> okay, if you so watch some of my videos, I'm like panting because I'm like, holy crap, this feels. <laughs> so you know, 
So I, I'd say if I could only hunt one, probably blondes. They're more consistent. And now that I'm in, in at lower elevations, they're easier for me to get to. But yeah, I like We have both. a question from Ella who wants to know, she says it's really, really dry where she is right now. Is it hopeless <laughs> this year, absent a good rain? It, absent a good rain, yeah, I would say, well, for, for certain mushrooms, yes. Uh, when it comes to morels, I, yeah, you, you kind of needed the snowpack and some spring rain or moisture. Um, but yeah, I, I would say it might rain in June or July and then you can hunt everything else because yeah, morels we are, hope We hope so. Yeah, morels and oysters and enoki are the early edibles that you can find in the spring. Um, uh, but they do, oysters and enoki especially, do need the moisture from the air. Morels, you can maybe find them along the creek beds and, and look for areas where uh, the snow can pool, uh, you know, like collect. And it's like a protected pocket with branches and and you know wood debris that kind of retains the moisture there you'll find you'll have better luck finding them there especially in dry years than okay. in your you know out in the open someone else tough. wants to know um when you're looking at precipitation maps what ideally you know are you looking for an inch two inches three inches i kind of just gauge it i would i would prefer at least about an an inch over you know the course of the last seven days or so i mean but colorado is the weather's uh could be weird and and i haven't quite exactly figured it out but if there if i haven't seen any moisture in the area i'm looking at for a week i i'm just kind of like okay i'll wait um but i only look at moisture maps for morels because i'm I'm just itching to get out there. So I, you know, I want to see where I'm going and what my plan is. Uh, so yeah, I, I'd say minimum half inch and then, or more, but uh, preferably an inch. Um, and I use that for mainly morels. And actually, no, I, I did use it for bullets too last year. <laughs> Just because, again, now that I don't live in the mountains, I have to really do my searches almost daily to check the weather and check whether or not it's going to rain and if I'm going to actually make the drive for the weekend. Right. So. Yeah, in Colorado, we often have regions of the state that will get uh, significantly more rain than others. And uh, uh, looking at a map can really pay off if you're going to drive an hour or two some some direction. Yeah. So I was just looking at somebody's question. Will the Snyder eye return to transferred year over light yellows? I, I'm return not to sure the same what, spot, maybe? Oh, yeah, it, it does return to the same spot. Um, and we've got a couple of spots in off this one trail that produce it when they when it produces oh my god it produces but then if it's dry i i find like maybe a couple few and then and then it dries up so yeah and uh yeah so i i did mention snyder eyes or that big fat honker that i'm going to call snyder eye <laughs> oh you I like big fat the, honker <laughs> yeah look for the oh, calocypha fulgens on that, um, the and, and what what the, say that again? The Calocypha fulgens, that that orange cup fungi, the orange cup, oh, kind yeah, of the bluish, That that's a good indicator that you're in the right area and about the right time. Um, the Calocyphas will start fruiting before um, before the morels start popping up and are noticeable, but they. The one in that picture I snapped and not too far from it were some black morels. So, so certain indicator plants to look for, the calocyphas, especially for those, uh, those Snyder eyes, other cup fungus. Um, I don't think I gave you guys some photos, but there's like Helvella, Aceta, 
Aspiculum. Um, those guys look a lot like a cup fungus, but they do have a short little stem to make them Haldella. Uh, and um, let's see, what other? There's also the, the mm, Neoplectena, Plectenia, Plectenia. And those are like black cups and they're very hard to notice. But if you, once you, you know, get down to the mushrooms level, you'll start spotting these little cups everywhere. And, and that's a good indicator. And we see those the, in burns too, those uh, yeah, little, we, little orange ones. And when they're the maybe geopixis. super tiny, it's too early. Yeah, the uh, geopixis carbonari, mm -hmm. carbonaria. Yeah, I like finding those. Um, but uh, yeah, for the Brunea, I usually find Calypso orchids. Oh, here, I got but, a picture um, of that for you. My yeah. favorite. Yeah. Uh, those are awesome. Yeah. yeah. They're so, so beautiful. Yeah. And, and there are some spots up in Woodland Park where I used to live. They had like these bright yellow lady slipper orchids in the woods. But that was later. But the Calypsos were up there. And that's usually around the 8,000 feet and up. So the Bruneas, um, that's what you'll, you'll be looking for. It'll, it helps you determine, am I in the right place and at the right time? If you find Calypso orchids and they're spent and they're starting to make little seed pods, you're late, <laughs> is all I can say. Or you might be able to find a few old, you know, few in like really shady areas, but that, that their flushing time is done. So maybe but, go go higher, maybe an elevation. Yeah, so start going up a little higher, and you'll find them. Like I said, I have found I have found the Bruneas up um, in the Pikes Peak area around over ten thousand feet in July. So you know you can always chase them up the hill and look for those certain plants, uh, cup fungus and orchids. Yeah, although by the time July comes along, there's like some other mushrooms where kind of ready to get after. Yes. Um, which I think we should talk about here. Well, I guess we can talk about the shanties. Yeah, let's do the shanty here. I'll put a little picture up. Um, what kind are we looking at here? So the predominant species in Colorado is the Cantharellus roseocanus. And the tops look like that. They, they're kind of a, a egg yolk color and then with more sun they can kind of get bleached out and light color but the defining feature of the roseocanus is the underside of it the gills or the false gills are um, uh, this intense orange yeah a bright orange color that's bright really bright and uh, they they typically have decurrent false gills that run down the site um, and they can grow in clusters or singly they are, there's one year that I couldn't do anything but find chanterelles. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's just, tough. A, it's a lucky That's thing. That's tough, wow. You just kind of walk out and you're like, oh, hey, look, more chanterelles. They're everywhere. Uh, that was a few years back when it was a really wet season. And mm -hmm. so, and, and the thing with these chanterelles is they grow where they want to grow, especially if it's <laughs> wet outside. I have found them in places like Ponderosa Pine Forest, where it's typically dry, I'll find them popping up if it's been wet. And I'm like, what the heck are these doing here? I'm not, I'm not complaining, but really, I'm looking for a Barosii or some lobsters, you know? Um, but yeah, so they, they have a very distinctive smell. They smell of like kind of sweet and fruity like apricots. And I actually made a chanterelle cheesecake for the PPMS a couple of times. Yum. Unfortunately, I didn't really use a recipe. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of just winged it. I made like a candy <laughs> chanterelle thing, like uh, caramelized chanterelles. And then I swirled it into like a vanilla bean cheesecake. It was really good. Um, and I've also made like chanterelle wine jellies with like Chardonnay or something. Um, but yeah, they're in um, mixed conifers, like I said, and, and I find them a lot in that Kinnick Kinnick stuff. Um, I don't know if you guys, and, and juniper bushes. Hang on to that for a minute. Let's go, before we could jump to the habitat, can you look at this picture and tell everybody about these gills that are not gills? 
Okay, so false gills are ridges. And if you look at this, this uh, chanterelle, you can tell that the, it's a part of the flesh as opposed to gills that you can easily separate from the flesh of the mushroom. This is actually part of it. Uh, it's almost like folds so, instead yeah, they're of like, gills. Exactly. They're more like folds and ridges on, on the bottom side of the mushroom. I mean, they are a spore-bearing surface, so people like to debate and say they are gills, but as a descriptor, they're considered false gills because you can't separate it easily from the, the main flesh. And false, uh, real gills, they, um, one mushroom look alike here to look out for because it can be toxic. And I have friends that can attest to that, uh, <laughs> is the Hygrophoropsis orontiaca. And they are an orange color like, like a chanterelle. And, and if you're inexperienced, you can get all excited. But those guys grow on wood or wood chips. And sometimes the wood is underground, um, but they have real gills as opposed to these false or ridges, whatever you want to call them. And um, thank you, Roxy, hymenal folds. <laughs> That's a jack-o'-lantern, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I grabbed this off is of it, Ophelata. That the, That's the Eluden. I don't know how you so, say it, the Ophelata. Ophelata Eludens. That's a jack-o'-lantern, and I don't think they grow in Colorado. But if you Google- Those are poisonous. Yes, those are poisonous, as is the Hygrophoropsis orontiaca, which does grow in Colorado and does grow in similar habitats. I found them in the same area I have found chanterelles. And if you're not careful and you're, you're new to this, you might mix up the, you might randomly pick up a Hygrophoropsis into your chanterelle basket. Um, a good way to identify, like I said, they have actual real gills they are orange they're like pretty much the same color throughout if you slice it in half the flesh is orangey color versus a chanterelle when you slice it it's got a white flesh it's always got a white yeah that's, yeah. A, that's yeah. A easy that's like easy my check. that's like my favorite tip right there the chanterelle flesh is always going to be white Right, and it's the Omphalotus and the Hygrophoropsis have orange, orangey yeah. flesh. It's the same color as the outside. Mm -hmm. so and they that, have gills. You know? And they True. have gill gills. Yeah. But when you're, yeah. when you're inexperienced, uh, Hygrophoropsis can look a lot like a chanterelle because they also have decurrent gills. So it runs down the site just like a chanterelle would. Um, but yeah, it's orange throughout. Okay. That's so, fun fact. Fun fact about jack o' lanterns, by the way, is that they are they glow in the dark. Look, hence the name. So <laughs> cool. Yeah. So you were talking about the habitat, though, and I was like, wait a minute, let's talk about the gills. So let's come back to that. And I think you were talking about some of the bushes and shrubs and trees that you were finding nearby. Yes. Yeah, so I will find them in the Kinnikinnik. They. In this photo, this is like one of my big patches of shanties uh, up on near Brown Park Range. And, um, and yeah, when they flush, they flush and it's a gorgeous sight. And it's really exciting. I, Those are I mean, big. They're, they're big, they're beautiful, they're beautiful. And I swear when I found this patch, I almost wanted to just sleep there just to make sure nobody else <laughs> finds it. <laughs> because it was really close uh, to a trail. No. I mean, it was literally off the trail anyway um but they do come back year after year so you know if you happen to find a patch that some other people have you know picked you can come back next year a little earlier to try to beat them uh <laughs> but yeah so they they grow in patches and in, in this particular photo you'll see like some of the, the juniper bushes shrubs i don't know what they are and um i believe that's a spruce on the side and uh, sort of in a in a forest opening right there yeah, and this one was on a, a kind of a, I'm trying to look at the aspect here, kind of a northeastish hill. And so they fruited a little later. And this particular patch was at, I think it was probably around 9,500 feet. So I typically find those a little later. Um, like, uh, I'd say late July through August, they'll fruit. And you'll find you'll first find the tiny little buttons and you can find them as early as June and they look just like pebbles or gravel, which is like part of like the decomposing granite of, you know, Pikes Peak. Um, 
and you can come back to it every week and it won't do a darn thing until you get a really good rain like the july monsoon when the rains start coming about a week after the soaking rain they will like just explode and the whole there's like just tons of them i remember one summer in this area um backside of pikes peak i we were trying to get leave and we just kept stumbling upon patches and patches. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, there's just too many. We've like filled out all of our coolers. I don't know what else to do. So we <laughs> left the rest. I'm like, we'll come back later if we need to. <laughs> but, but they come back every year. So that's one of my reliable spots. So, you know, if I'm in the mood for shanties, I'll, I'll go to that spot. But it is a bit of a drive for me. And like I said, it's somewhere around... 9,500 feet to 10,000 feet elevation thereabouts. Um, We've had those years too with the big rains. It's been a couple of years where there's just so many of them out there and you think it's going to be like this every year. And it's been it's, at least three years since we've had that kind of rain. Um, we usually get, um, I feel like a little higher, like 10,000 feet and above out here, maybe. Uh, yeah. uh, we don't find many down, down by at the nines. Hmm. Um, there okay. was an, Another kind of yeah. interesting thing here we learned recently, I think it was, I think it was Eugenia that was showing us this. Yeah. Often where they grow, there's a big brown spot. Yeah, um, she called it a brulee. A brulee. Hmm. A brulee. Which is French for burn or something, right? Yeah, and I, I think the idea was that the mushrooms are sort of um, – it taking the nutrients from the soil in in those areas and so it was leaving sort of this brown crust and oh. uh i mean when you think about it we often find chanterelles in sort of mossy uh edges on for of forest openings here in in the mountains in mixed conifer forest similar territory to where we find porcini um, but you do see this idea of, and you kind of see it here where the soil is kind of brown right around the mushrooms. Um, yeah. And a few have snuck out into the moss out, but even down yeah. here, it's brown too. Um, yeah. I've, I've been really noticing that now when we find uh, morels, when we find yeah, chanterelles. I'll have, to, I'll have to pay attention to that. Too. Yeah, I do. And, and I mean, I figured the browner areas just had a little more sun because I'll find these guys littered when the year's good. Like I said, if, when I first started hunting before I really knew a whole lot of anything, it, that was 2014, I just kept finding patches and patches and patches of chanterelles. I'm like, okay, I've had enough of these things. And I took it for granted because then the following year it was dry and then it was dry and I'm like, oh my God, I'm running out of shanties in my freezer. So, you <laughs> yeah. know, so this year, because there haven't been, a, there weren't a lot of burns in Colorado last summer. I think I'm going to focus on hunting the shanties and, and replenishing my supplies. <laughs> we kind of had a similar scenario when we first started hunting. It was, it was a super wet year and we didn't know what we didn't know. It was like mushroom topia everywhere. There were so many chanterelles. We were just moaning all the time about all this cleaning that we had to do. Cause as you know, chanterelles are, sometimes yeah. difficult to get clean and yeah. uh, we haven't had that kind of chanterelle year since and that was probably seven years ago or something in our areas we've had certainly like, yeah, yeah that's i mean it's about the same as ours it's yeah it's been a while and and cleaning shanties is the reason why i got a mushroom knife with the brush yes. because yeah. now I force myself to just sit down, make myself comfortable, especially if I find a patch like this and just mm -hmm. clean it as I go and make sure that what I put in my basket is, you know, 90% clean. All the big chunks of dirt is knocked off and gone because once they get into those ridges and they're pretty delicate. So even once they get in there, it's really hard to get them out without like, like one of those air cans that you can use for, for cleaning yeah. out your keyboard or whatever. Um, but yeah, so I highly recommend a mushroom knife that has, a, you know, the, the brush on one end and the folding curved knife on the other. It's very helpful. After you come home with a few pounds or gallons of dirty chanterelles, 
you will also be a believer. It's just that simple. After you do it once, you're like, I'm not doing this again. I'm cleaning them in the field. Yeah. Exactly. So, we, so yeah, it's, yeah, I highly recommend you just clean them and make sure they're clean before you put it in your basket. And if you're collecting other things, clean those things too, like bullets. I That one patch I find also is in an area where the Boletus borosii grow and they grow about the same time. So if I'm picking borosii or not borosii, the ruberceps, my bad, ruberceps. Uh, if I'm picking out boletes as well as chanterelles, I make sure that I carve off all the dirt off of the boletes or the lactariuses and whatever else I decide to throw in my bag. So we have actually some questions and some tips here that I like. Um, <clears throat> Roxy is saying they soak their morels sliced open in salt water. Is it okay to wash mushrooms right before you cook them? So I yeah. think uh, either Trent or Hua, you can speak to that for sure. Right, Hua, I'll take that one. <laughs> I wash them before I cook them because I don't like grit and I don't like bugs <laughs> in my food. So yeah, it's okay to wash them right before you cook them because you can do a dry saute and let most of that moisture evaporate before you add everything else. Um, it's just not recommended that you wash them and then store them because right. they'll get um, and yes, I do use a potato peeler for bolites at times. Yes, great but when, tip. <laughs> but when we're out in the field, I try to, you know, use my the curved knife and just kind of scrape off as much of the dirt as I can. I mean, small chunks that are embedded in there is no big deal, but the big chunks that's going to fall off and then get under your chan chanterelle guilt, well, you know, Surface. False gills. False gills. I don't want to say gills because I keep saying false. Yeah. You know. False. Although she she said she soaked them in salt water. Yeah, which and I, I think that's like a Midwestern thing to get ants yeah. and stuff out of it. I don't know that that's, you need to well, do that's that. That's for here. morels, though. Yes. So yeah, and and the, I think the salt water is to kill off any of the bugs and get them to crawl out, because I've done that. And, uh, and then I'll, I'll rinse them out, slice them in half and set them on some towels to dry a little or, you know, before I cook them and that's fine. But um, I think- We had a question about Orion Matsutakis to too. And I was gonna just say, no, we're not talking about Matsutakis, but we will do an entire <laughs> webinar just on Matsutakis. Yeah, yeah Matsutakis. I would love to, to see that because yeah. Matsutakis on my wish, on my, um, bucket list of things to find and haven't found them because most of the places I hunt do not have uh, the lodgepole pines. Mm -hmm. I'm usually in ponderosa pine forests. I think one final tip that Orion brought up um, that I'm glad you did, I wanted to say, sometimes you just have to wash your chanterelles because they're so dirty from we usually rain wash or, our or whatever. And, and so don't be afraid to fully submerse those things, wash them. Um, but as Hua said, you don't want to then take them and put them right in the fridge. What, you, what you're going to have to do if you do that is to set them out on sort of like um, wire mesh trays on a table and then put a fan on them overnight and at least get them back to uh, the dryness level that they were in when you picked them so that you can store them. So you can wash them. You can totally submerge them in water. They get rained on. You just have to um, spend a bit more time treating them carefully and getting them a little bit back to their level of dryness. Um, okay, we so maybe we want to keep, keep moving here. Yeah. Yep, let's yeah. move on to hedgehogs. Well, so hedgehogs, they look a lot like shanties from the top, but from, <clears> what, <throat> from my experience, they prefer it a little bit wetter than the chanterelles. The chanterelles, um, in this photo, let me close that. That's a photo of Michael, my husband, in front of a patch of hedgehogs. And you can tell that it's, a, it's really mossy. And it was right by a, sm a little stream that's constantly trickling. And um, so I'll find those guys in the wetter areas along banks and streams or mossy areas where water can collect like underneath rocks or whatever. And- um, Are those umbilicatums? Hmm? Are those umbilicatums? So there are two, I think there might be two species here. There's the rapandum and the umbilicatum. And the, I'm not sure because I found these, or this particular picture 
was, you know, earlier on in my mushroom hunting days where I was just like, ah, it's a hedgehog, I'll eat it. Uh, but yes, if you zoom in, one does look very much like an um umbilicatum, which is basically a little belly button or, a, you know, indentation on the top. There's a couple in here that look like they have the indentations and they are, these were kind of a terracotta color. Um, Texture-wise, when you're when fresh, they're a little more brittle than chanterelles. I know that, so they break pretty easily. Um, and of course, they have teeth as opposed to gills or pores. They have <laughs> these little spines. That's hence the nickname of the hedgehog. Um, and they have a similar texture when you cook them to chanterelles. Sometimes I like them better than shanties just because it doesn't have that overpowering apricot smell to them when you cook them. Um, but yes, there's also the hydnum repandum, which is a bit larger than the umbilicatum and slightly lighter color, like more of a cream as opposed to like this orangey, I don't know, peachy color <laughs> is the best way I can describe them. I, like I said, in wetter areas also, and, and this particular area, I find hedgehogs right by the creek or the stream. It's just a little trickling stream. It's not even a creek. Um, and just up the hill, I find patches of shanties. This is the one thing I miss about being in Woodland Park. Yeah, and I think <laughs> just like the chanterelles, these, these guys don't dry up very well. You, you would want to yeah. saute and freeze them, not dehydrate them. Um, yep. I really, I really like them a lot. I think if, if I had to choose and if I could only have one of those two, I would probably pick hedgehogs to eat every day over chanterelles. I am right with you on that. But they're smaller and a lot harder to pick. It takes a lot longer to pick a basket full of these little guys. And again, because they have teeth, they're a lot harder to clean if you yeah. don't pick it on the spot, especially once the dirt and crap get in underneath those, poor, those uh, teeth, you kind of have to sit there and scrape off all the teeth and that gets really time consuming. If you cleaned all the mushrooms, I would eat hedgehogs. But if I had to clean the mushrooms and eat them, <laughs> I would pick chanterelles. So they the are, whole cleaning uh, thing is eh. They are I love them difficult both. to clean in my opinion. <laughs> and yes, I, I all like stand in front of the sink sometimes with the water on and like the high pressure spray and just spray the other living crap out of the yeah. gills or false yeah. gills for the teeth. But sometimes you just got to get in there with a knife and start scraping it away. But um, yeah, so again, you can definitely get these things wet right before you cook. Yeah, so many people say don't get your mushrooms wet, blah, blah, blah. And I mm -hmm. feel like we do it all the time with a lot of different mushrooms and to no ill effect, they're, they're great. So. Well, you just have to, again, make sure that if you need to store them after you get them wet, that you take care of them and dry them out a bit somehow under a fan or yeah. Yeah, racks, so, whatever. So usually I do like a multi-level cleaning. I clean there when I'm picking. Then when I get home, I do a quick clean with a brush or a paper towel just to wipe away as much of the dirt as I can before I store it. And then right before I cook, I will run them under the them. sink and make sure I get all the grit and dirt out. I don't, I just don't like the tape, the grit in my mouth. It's, yeah. it's unpleasant. Um, but uh, what was I going to say? I already forgot. Um, I don't know. Like? I think we were, I think oh, so we I was, have the, the, the two mushrooms right next to each other, the chanterelle and the hedgehog, but one's in a wetter environment. Yes. One's in a wetter environment. The other one's is slightly, they still like it moist that you're not going to find them in very dry areas, but they, they're, they don't like it quite as wet and mossy as the hedgehogs. Uh, what I was going to say in terms of preserving hedgehogs, the hedgehogs and shanties is you can also steam them instead of sauteing them because, you know, doing the saute, you have to slice them up, saute it, reduce it, then package it to freeze. If you just put a bunch in like a steam basket and just steam it for a few minutes and then drain it and let them dry off a bit, they freeze really well that way. Huh. So that's another way to, to preserve. But I, I haven't tried drying just because from what I've read, it's not recommended. They're kind of, they lose the texture and the, the aroma and it's just not good. Yeah, they're totally disappointing drying, no, I, I think. You know. Questions. I think we should keep moving based on time here. Yeah. To the Look, Barosiae. Uh, what a beauty. 
Wow, well, you have the most beautiful mushroom photos, by the way. You get like the perfect specimen every time. I, oh my God, I have so many photos. I only sent you like good ones. Um, <sighs> but yeah, I, I, when I first started learning them, before I started really getting into edibles, because they say you should really learn about the toxic lookalikes first, is getting really good photos. Because if you don't document it on the spot, you know, when you get home, you're not going to really remember because it's been rolling around in your basket. And now you're trying to do a sport pit and you're like, I have no idea what this is. So I made it a point to make really good photo, take really good photos. And I just use my phone camera. I considered getting a real SLR camera for this, but then now I just use my phone camera. It's good enough and it does a pretty darn good job. And it, it'll also geolocate for me. So yeah. if I forget where I found these things. I can always go back and look at the map. Um, so Barosi eyes, um, they like ponderosa pines and occasionally with spruce, but where I find them, it's always ponderosa pines and they kind of like it on the drier side of things. Like I find them with the lobster mushrooms up on like slightly drier areas. I'll find them in wet areas, but they're always buggy. Even buttons are buggy. They'll, they're just icky. So I, I go, I'll sacrifice those and try to find the ideal ones. And this one was found right off of a trail and behind me, you can kind of see that's the trail. And it was literally just a couple steps off the trail and underneath Ponderosa Pines, they were in that little juniper bush time kind of thing. Um, but yeah, they're, they're considered the white the king bully, white kings or whatever they have. Do they call them queens? I've heard them called Some queens. Some people call them queens and that's why I just don't use common names. I just say <laughs> brosy eyes and most people know what I'm talking about. I know there are other genre of mushrooms that have a brosy eye too, but when I'm talking about, you know, bullets, it's part of the edulis group. I just saw a question flash through. So uh, the Boletus borosii, the Boletus rubriceps are the two main boletes in Colorado, and they are part of the edulis group. Uh, edulis typically is for the European boletes, and in the U.S. there's several different species. In Montana, there's one that looks more closely related to the the actual edulis that Kathy Cripps calls edulis, but Quo disagrees. Um, but, you know, I, I think he disagrees in the sense that it's probably not the exact edulous species that is the type species in Europe. Yeah. So even though they're part of the group, if you call this a Boletus edulis, you would be corrected and rightfully so. Mm, no, I, I would disagree with that. Really? You could say it's an edulous. I was asking a question. It, you can call it a porcini, you know, but, yeah. the, you know, because but, porcini just kind of is a blanket cover of these fat piglet bullets. Um, but I wouldn't call it an edulis now that I know the differences. But uh, yeah, it's in the it's under the same umbrella or clade or well, whatever. Well, I mean, wasn't it that edulis is a species, right? And Colorado yeah. porcini used to be called Boletus edulis, um, mm -hmm. but they have since, like so many other mushrooms, been renamed to be rubiceps. Um, and those are the ruby capped porcinis. Mm -hmm. This particular one, this white bullet, is a barosii. So, and I, and they give them different names because they can't. You can't mate like an edulis with a barosii, or you know. So that's why they are genetically different, and they also grow in different habitats. And I I do think that we have. Edulis yeah. still in Colorado because I, we find porcini that are not rubriceps right. and they are not barosii. So, so um, was who awesome. knows? But uh, yeah, look at those beauties. Yeah. So that cluster of uh, barosii was found on the side of our house up in Woodland Park. It was like right off the driveway. So yeah, again, my only reason for missing Woodland Park. Um, but when it comes to the edulis, like you were saying, I agree because I had that one photo of Michael Quo kind of taking a, a, a photo documenting the, 
the different look of it. And he agrees it is not a rubriceps, um, but it's an unnamed species for Colorado um, at the moment, but it could be very well be considered that edulous that Kathy Cripps refers to up in Montana and other areas of the Rockies. So, so many people think this is the best tasting. I have yeah, heard that. I like rosy eyes better than rubriceps for a couple of reasons. Hmm. They're a little drier. So when you saute them, they don't get slimy, that slimy texture that you get from uh, the rubriceps. And they have a, a kind of a nuttier taste to them. So yeah, I do like the brosy eyes better. Um, but I seem to find more rubriceps and brosy eyes. Just, just happens to be where I'm typically hunting, I guess. But yeah, they, they definitely, when I was up in Woodland Park, they were everywhere the brosy eyes, and I miss that. Uh, but the, it's, I've never found them in other pine, but I've read that they will grow amongst other types of pines, but I typically find them in Ponderosa pine forests um, at around 8,500 feet, just because that's where I am. But I think I've seen people find them down in Black Forest, which is uh, maybe 6,000 or 6,500 feet elevation. Oh. Um, oh. Just as long as it's in Ponderosa forests. Um, and I'll find those sometime in mid to late July all the way through August is the, the season for them. And that is the same season as the river saps. And um, let's see. And do they piggyback into the lobsters? They do because I will find, so there's a, this trail that I used to go to all the time near, near our house up in Woodland Park. And we had this one little area up on a ridge that's kind of, um, gets a lot of sun. It's all, it's predominantly Ponderosa and Aspens. And we'll, there's one section that I call Boulder Alley, which I refer to bullies as boulders, but the their burrosy eyes in that area. And then right down the lane is Lobster Lane. So <laughs> lobsters Cute. are right there. They grow under, well, they'll grow anywhere Russellus grows or Russellus and Lactarius because the lobster mushroom is actually Hypomyces lactiflorum. And that's a parasite on typically Rus Russellus and Lactarius and it's in Colorado, it would be the Russella brother piece, which is like this huge white mushroom that is pretty inedible in its original form. But once it's, it, once it's parasitized by this hypomyces guy, it is really good. Uh, it turns it this bright orange color, like a, lop, a cooked lobster. Um, and if you want to find them, I usually find them in Ponderosa pine forests where, um, where the burrosy eyes grow and they prefer drier areas like kind of a south southeast to southwest facing uh, aspect so it gets lots of sunshine and when it gets a lot of rain it dries out pretty quickly and um and if you happen to find a uh, russell above peas start following that ring because chances are you'll find a, a lobster in that ring as well. So that's kind of, if you're new to it, look for orange peels poking out of the ground because that's really what it looks like. It just look like orange things popping up underneath the dust and, and then you can uncover them and they bright orange, some of them are huge. Um, they can grow in wetter areas, but usually they're infested with maggots and other bugs. So, <laughs> so go for dry. Oops. <laughs> Lobsters can be really be kind of buried under that duff too. So you, you might just see like little bits of orange peel, like you said, and then that whole mushroom is under the dirt. Yeah. But this may we'll be an obvious question. Is the, is the brevipes, the Russula brevipes, is, is that an indicator species for you? It is because that is usually the species that the hypomyces will parasitize out here, or at least in my, my so, hunting areas. So you'll see some unpar unparasitized, um, Brevipedes yeah. floating around um, generally, is that? Yes, absolutely. If I start finding Russellas, especially the Brevipedes, the, and they're, they're pretty unmistakable. They're big and white. And sometimes it's just, you'll just see duff pushing up. And when you pop off that duff, you'll see this big white mushroom. And you're like, great, 
that Sorosal abrevipes, that means lobsters could be nearby. <laughs> and then I keep my eyes peeled for orange peel um, on the ground. And, and that's usually how I find it. They come back to the same patches year after year. So like I said, I have lobster lane up in on Rampart Range area and, uh, and I'll find them. And that... I think that's a brevipes. No, no. Mm. That doesn't look like a brevipes. No, the brevipes are more shaped. They have that flute shape, kind of like Yeah, they kind of have a flute shape because if you look at and the they're lobster, dense. They have, yeah, they're very dense. Uh, there's also the Lactarius piperatus. Looks very similar to the brevipes, but when you cut the gills, it'll like start lactating using some milky substance and you know, they'll parasitize those as well. And I found parasitized lacteria, I'm not sure which species, but I think it's a different hypomyces than To be clear for people, uh, mm -hmm. you don't want to be eating the Russell abrevipes. You, you only no. eat it after it's been parasitized by the hypomyces and has turned into a lobster mushroom. Exactly. Yeah. The brevipes, if you try to eat it, it's not going to kill you. Yes. It's just yeah. really bitter and not palatable. Are the, like, those yeah, look more like those, those brevipes? They look sort of like brevipes. Yeah, except I the thought they were more white. Buff. Yeah. The brevipes is usually whiter. So mm -hmm. at least the ones that we find, and that could be just age. Yeah, uh, true. But the season for lobsters is pretty much the season for everything else. I mean, there was one day we went in this, our little area. It's a magical area, I'm telling you. <laughs> is this <laughs> it right here? Yeah, that, that's like, you can see them out of the ground. This was a pretty big patch. And that one picture of the basket, all of those lobsters were from this one patch. And so we can get quite a bit. And uh, we find them, again, in this one little area up on Rampart that has shanties, hedgehogs, and then we just go up the hill, up the trail to the drier spots to find the brosy eyes and the lobsters. And all of this happens, like, typically um, lobsters will come up around late July through August because, again, the, the brevipes have to start popping up and then it parasitizes it. And by the time it pushes it out of the ground, it's become a lobster. So is this know. a lobster right here? That is oh. a lobster. I think it's a partially hypomycete. Uh -huh. it, uh, yeah. <laughs> you can really see the brevipede shape in that one. Yeah. So that one was partially um, parasitized. I don't think I ate that one. I, I looked at it and I'm like, it doesn't look like it's done. So I just stuck it back in the ground. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just saw somebody commenting about Lactarius delicios. Uh, sport print for a lobster. I mean, there's really no look-alike for lobsters. I mean, they are unmistakable. They have that bright orange, lob cooked lobster color, and their flesh is like a basically white, and it's a solid flesh, heavy. You could do a spore print. Spore color would be pretty much white. I believe because I had I found some older lobsters that you can see the white spores on it, um, but yeah, it's unnecessary to do a spore print for lobsters. I don't. Yeah. I mean, you can if you want to. <laughs> Nobody's gonna stop you. Um, but yeah, so I find those usually end of July through August. I'll I'll find them as late as like Labor Day weekend, kind of early, early oh. September. Um, because they, they do like to grow dry. So even if the rain stop, they're still around, but they might start getting old by mid September, at least in my areas, again, around 8,000 to 10,000 feet. I've, you know, they're kind of everywhere in the Rampart and Pikes Peak area. We've, we've never found one out here in this part of the state, but I've, I've been looking at Ponderosa Pondies on the map tree maps trying to figure out where they are so we can go look for some lobsters. And Front range, well, baby. <laughs> yeah, we might have to come out to Head your neck of the woods. Yeah. yeah, come out this way. If you come out okay. this way, we'll go home. Uh, hey, you guys, it's about 8.03 here, so we're yeah. we're probably good to um, to wrap up. Does oh, anyone have any burning yeah. questions that they want to ask Hua tonight? I saw about you. Anything? Uh, Ryan said found a couple of lobsterized deliciosas last year. Ah. That's it. Hypomyces liter whatever that is. I don't know how to pronounce that. Laterite radius. Yeah. 
right uh, and and black. Anyway, those are kind of a yellowish color. Um, yeah. I've never tried eating them. So if, I mean, I know lactarius deliciosus are edible, so maybe. And um, how do you uh, keep I, off private lands when hunting? Look for private property, do not trespass signs. Uh, there are also, um, you use on X hunt we use gaia We're, we use gaia oh, yeah. ourselves and there's a so, layer on gaia called i'm gonna look it up okay i i don't use either of those on x hunt and gaia but i use um avenza map which is a free app and then i go to the usgs forest service and download maps from them they have uh, MVUM maps for motorized vehicles and it shows it's all in grayscale though so it's not as nice as your Gaia um, but it'll show shaded areas to show forest land like national forest land versus you know city or private property so it gives you a better idea that you are in national forest or public land it's usually like a grayish color as opposed to just white um, so I use those for you know, just to get an idea of how to get there because it'll show off-road off -road roads as well so that if you have a four by four or all wheel drive, you can maybe go off-road a little um, and follow those trails. And um, the USGS also has elevation maps as, that you can look at, but you can't do the cool overlays like you can with Gaia. Um, uh, I looked it up, it's called the land use, Neotrex land use filter. I always have it on, I should know what it is. And it very clearly tells you private US yeah. Forest Service, BLM, National Parks, Indian Reservation, state, county. Yeah, land. and and I know Avenza has, you can purchase maps like that as well, but I haven't played with a lot of it. I've just been using free maps because, you know, I like to save money. This is a hobby. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. Cool. Well, thanks so much. Uh, wow, that was an awesome presentation. Or yes. discussion. Have fun. We didn't get to touch on honeys, but that's okay. Ah, another time. Another yeah. time. Yeah, there's. We only touched on a fraction of the mushrooms we could have talked about with you. So oh, there, there's 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 more to come maybe. Yeah. 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 Especially you know when. I say mid July through as soon as we get the summer rains, it's game on. <laughs> so, so we can talk then. Okay. We super. have we have we have one last question about uh, white chanterelles. Do we have white chanterelles here in Oregon? I've never. Or, I mean, in Colorado. I have never. I found don't think that we do. I've only I don't know for sure. Um, I'm gonna say no. Yeah, no, yeah. but they I'm do not have sure. the not sure. The blue chanterelles also on my bucket list. Oh, blue. Yeah. yeah. yeah Google that, you guys. Those. Google Google blue chanterelles in Colorado. They're Paleozellus really multiplex. There we go. That's the same. We'll leave that for for yeah. next for next time. time. Okay. For somebody Thanks, who actually has found them. Thank you all. Bye, you guys. Thanks so much. Bye.